few minutes. Um, listen, thanks for the uh, the opportunity, and and Tharan, you'll be you'll be pleased to know that I'm a little bit less cranky than I was in uh, in Halifax in uh, 2018, because um, that was a, a particularly vociferous and and exciting uh, panel that that was uh, a little bit chippier than I had uh, thought it uh, might be. Uh, listen, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I, I have a ton of time for uh, for IPAC, uh, both in terms of, of the public policy space and the work that it does, the research and all of those aspects, but also just in terms, frankly, of the spirit of volunteerism and the, the effort to make uh, uh, to have a professional association that, that goes literally across the country. And uh, as mentioned, I had an opportunity to work at the provincial level, um, a variety of jobs ending up as the head of the public service, and I was there for forever, and I'm going to correct the, the record there. I think I was there from 1981 till uh, 2014, so 33 years in that shop alone, then the better part of three years in the city and a little bit more than two years here. So I'm getting seriously, uh, seriously uh, old, but remain energized by the opportunity to serve and remain energized by the opportunity to make and implement uh, good public policy and to work closely with uh, with ministers in the overall uh, government. I, I still find it exciting and I find that, that in IPAC I, I'm among uh, company and people who I think enjoy public policy, enjoy the work we uh, do and have a common, common effort to make things uh, better from our unique uh, vantage, uh, vantage point. So thrilled to be part of the IPAC uh, forum and commend you for your, your work and cooperation and I think the commitment to, uh, to problem solving. Um, I'm going to go through a few points and, and as I do them, um, it's important to say that these are, are my opinion. They're not uh, Treasury Board uh, Secretariat. I may exaggerate them a little bit for, uh, for effect. Um, well, I'm accountable for what I, I say. You know, I probably will uh, exaggerate and, and I wouldn't take what I'm saying as a literal or gospel to take it as indicative of at least one person's thinking about, uh, about current events and how we react to, uh, uh, to the reality of the, the pandemic, the evolution of, of uh, the pandemic, which I think front and center for all of us as we work on, on uh, public policy and kind of inescapable reality and one that, that has demanded and will continue to demand an extraordinary level of, of public policy. Uh, response. So I'll basically just go through in my, my time three or four uh, kind of core uh, core points and then, as I said, happy to have a brief dialogue or chat about uh, about them. The first thing I want to say is, is um, I don't think the pandemic's obviously not over yet. Obviously, we have uh, spikes and, and maybe an increasingly feeling and looking like statistically a, a second uh, wave. But there's, there's a tendency to kind of think we understand it in terms of, of its economic uh, effects. And, and I don't think we understand that yet. I think we have some, some early preliminary indication of the devastating impact in terms of, of aspects of the service economy and the gig economy and tourism and other things. Um, and I think we have some sense that, that some sectors, banking, those of us privileged enough to work uh, remotely have done actually okay. But I don't think the story is, is uh, finished yet. I don't think we have a sense of the impact on settlement patterns on the urban uh, environment, on whether or not you know, the ability that we've suddenly discovered to uh, do a lot of work uh, remotely is a, a temporary or a permanent uh, shift what it will do to the service economy, but, but in particular, what it's gonna do, you know, how long is the border gonna be closed? And I think, you know, prior to March, it would have been unimaginable. Like Canadian policy has been geared for decades to thinning that border. And the border not only got a little bit thicker with the occasional Trump tariff and other irritation and you know, real problems, uh, uh, the brilliantly negotiated uh, uh, Kuzma, but, but now we're in a situation where the border is actually closed and it's not closed for goods and it's not closed for all services, but it's a lot thicker. And what is that gonna mean over a period of, of uh, time? So I just think that, that as we think about what are the change structures in our economy? What are the impact on the labor markets? What are the impact on labor market participation? What are the impact on uh, the less advantaged of our uh, economy and other things? I think, I think that's something we need to spend time on. And I'll say something a little bit challenging from a, uh, an IPAC and, a, and an NCR perspective, but, but you know, public servants are insulated from change. 
we're one of the few organizations where we effectively have gone through the pandemic without threat of furlough or layoff or any kind of formal uh, adjustments in the government of Canada. We have an extraordinarily generous uh, uh, job protection and uh, uh, policies and, and carefully rolled out. And I think, I think the better part of, of Valor, I, th I support them. They're, they're closely associated with my advice in Treasury Board. But I think that, that they may insulate us a little bit from the economic uh, reality. And, and I think from a national capital region as well, the NCR is, is frankly a little bit insulated from some of the, the impacts that happen in uh, the West or, or other areas of, of the economy. So I think one of the things that we need to struggle with as, as policymakers and as advisors and as implementers and doers in the national capital region, part of IPAC, is basically to get perspective on happening, what's happening uh, elsewhere. Travel's ruled out, but I encourage you to, to read widely about the pan-Canadian uh, experience in, uh, in both languages and reflecting the full duality of, of uh, our country and, and to think a little bit about what it means for for other regions and other groups, uh, particularly in a regional uh, context. Um, I think it is important to spend some time understanding those things and to be, to be kind of, I think, generous in our understanding of the potential impacts. We know very clearly, and, and you know, from the bio, you know that I'm old enough to have lived through the, uh, uh, obviously, the 2008-9 uh, recession when I had the, the privilege of being the Ontario Deputy of Finance through that uh, experience. The consequences and the knock-on consequences of that are still being felt now. I was also, you know, in a policy job in the uh, sharp, severe uh, Ontario recession in uh, the early uh, 1990s and kind of directly impacted in a labor market sense and, and a challenge in getting work in the uh, early 80s uh, recession as a uh, as well, lucky to land a public service job at that point uh, in time. So I think in a very real way, you know, the kind of knock on or lag effects that we have from, from economic restructuring associated with recessions are something that you only experience and, and can truly appreciate with time and fairly sophisticated statistical analysis. It's early days and we're still in the, uh, the churn. So I urge us to think through and try and understand and be respectful of, of frankly, the damage and to some extent the opportunities, but mostly the risks that other Canadians have realized as a function of, of the pandemic and economic and health and other uh, risks. I do believe that, that the government of Canada and other governments across the country have been enormously responsive in terms of, of their public policy uh, response. And I think we've seen across the governments uh, of uh, Canada, federal, provincial, and uh, municipal. But, but we'll have that, a bunch of lawyers working for him for years and the rest of his life. And uh, I'll just uh, emphasize that I appreciate the legal uh, advice. It'll lawyers, be incredibly important as we move on. <laughs> Um, that, that our policies have actually been, I think, responsive. They've been, by and large, in uh, uh, following the best policy advice, including as that policy advice has, has evolved. Certainly from a federal perspective, there's been enormously uh, responsive policy development and implementation with words we didn't even think of in March, like CERB and CHOOSE and all of the public health initiatives and, and frankly, our ability to roll out tools, including Microsoft 365 and a whole bunch of other things, uh, an extraordinary level of responsiveness that I think in, uh, in February, we didn't think we had that in us. And I think it's been an amazing, amazingly uh, strong public policy response across that country. And I think from the government of Canada's perspective and NCR, something we can be justifiably uh, uh, proud of. I think we've got to be careful about reflecting how privileged we've been in that. But I do think that there are lessons learned about when we focused in on outcomes, as we had to with CERB or CHOOSE or the Canada Emergency Wage System, uh, uh, Subsidy or other things. You know, as we focused in on the outcomes rather than the process, we've been able to put things in an extraordinary rapidity. And I think we've probably learned that we've not only made time savings, but we've probably made fiscal savings uh, uh, as well through our rapid, uh, rapid implementation. Um, so I think that actually sets us up to be different uh, going uh, forward. And I think the combination of, of trying to understand what are the changes in our society? What are the vulnerabilities? What are the economic risks? What are the policies that might, uh, might be responsive to a changed environment going forward? And then I think we actually need to set back and, and uh, frankly, in our advice and our implementation, spend some time actually understanding in a changed environment, what are the appropriate policies? 
And I don't think the appropriate policies are necessarily the ones we've been implementing by rote over a long period of, of time. I think there will be opportunity for more flexibility, for creative implementation, for a much richer dialogue with our federal provincial, uh, uh, with our provincial uh, partners. And I observed from the government prone speech that essentially every major item uh, uh, is requires provincial uh, cooperation. So I think that a lot of our conversation has to be, if we want these policy outcomes, how, who needs to be on board? What will be the mechanisms by which we'll achieve them? And I think to some extent, we've tended to use the deliverology method to, to kind of focus in on what are our policy objectives and what are our measurements. But I think we have not been as detailed as we can be about talking about what are the actual, you know, what. At what is the link between those? How do our public policies actually drive the change? What are the fiscal regulatory partner instruments that actually make the required uh, change? And I think we owe, as we develop policy advice for a government that is ambitious, I think we owe that government very detailed planning, not an overbearing, you know, unrealistic, we're gonna plan things we can't do in an IT sense, but I think in a sense of, of, of connecting our policy objectives with our actual policy instruments and demonstrating very clearly how the investments we make will generate the policy uh, outcomes and will ensure that we're not dealing with unintended uh, uh, consequence. I think a really critical part of that, of that is to actually step outside of our bureaucratic and I'm gonna say frankly national capital region uh, selves and have a dialogue in real or in virtual terms, but have a dialogue with citizens and try and understand. And if we can't have a real dialogue with citizens, and sometimes we can't, just use essentially our, our common sense to actually try and figure out what are the impacts on the real people we're trying to serve. And to be as direct as we possibly can, and not just to think of things in, in uh, theoretical terms, but to think of them in very real terms about what will be the direct impact. And I'm spending an awful lot of time right now on IT. And one of the dominant uh, lessons from federal IT has been the need to actually shift the paradigm to deal directly with users. Sometimes those users are fellow bureaucrats, but most of the time it's the people out there in our communities that we are serving. And I think as we work through our both operational and implementation things, there is an, there is an opportunity to continue to develop, but especially in a pandemic uh, uh, context, try and actually work through how will policies, what's the felt impact of those uh, programs? What's the program design? How are we gonna understand, measure, and amplify the real and positive impacts of what we're doing? And I think that, that that's gonna require some different skills than we have right now. I think at, at the Government of Canada, and especially in the National Capital Region, we are extraordinarily skilled at policy. We're extraordinarily skilled at translating the government's policy direction, speech from the throne, budgets, into broad actions and into fiscal allocations. I don't think we step away from those skills. I think we remain proud of them, but I think there are some other things that we can begin to develop. And that includes greater interaction at the citizen level. And that includes greater technical and digital uh, skills so that we can understand how implementation, particularly implementation of IT enabled programs and virtually all new programs or existing programs and program reform, program transformation will be IT enabled. And I think developing those skills is gonna be absolutely critical. I also think, and this is a, a fairly serious pitch here, that, that um, reform will require public servants to step up in their full diverse and inclusive selves. And I think that, that when we look across the um, federal public service, including at senior levels, you'll see a fair amount of homogeneity in thinking and in other characteristics. And we are frankly more homogeneous than the citizens we serve. I think that raises questions and they're deserved and important questions around human rights and our ability to, to uh, fully represent Canadians, our ability to act, uh, provide access to, uh, to government roles. I think that's an important part of the conversation. But I think it's also an important part of the business conversation because we cannot achieve, you know, we cannot achieve citizen service or citizen responsiveness or the best possible uh, results for outcomes unless we understand the experience of citizens. And we can't understand that unless we are more representative. So I think the diversity and inclusion agenda is, it's, it's not an abstract one, it's a very real one that relates into, frankly, our ability to respond as public servants, our ability to understand and take our privilege as public servants. We are extraordinarily lucky 
to be in a position of offering real response to the pandemic. I think that that diversity and inclusion and continued development of our technical skills is an absolute critical part of, of that. So listen, colleagues, I fit a lot of different themes into, into that. I, I'm gonna sum up and say that, that I think we do need to you know, take stock of the pandemic and, and not say we know it now, but to keep our eyes and ears open and to be extraordinarily sensitive to the damage, and I think to some extent the continuing damage that's done to, to our fellow uh, citizens. I think frankly, we can take some comfort in, in the degree of responsiveness that we've had as federal public servants, but also as public servants across the country. I think municipalities have been extraordinarily uh, responsive. I think um, uh, provinces have also been responsive. I think their public servants have been, uh, have been responsive. And, and you, know, you guys know from my background that I, I um, uh, have had an opportunity to work in different levels. And I think that we have a lot more in common with those other uh, governments than we sometimes uh, uh, realize. I think we can feel very, very comfortable about what we've done. But I do think there's a real, there's an opportunity for continued reset on a going forward uh, basis. And that reset includes kind of making sure that we bring all of ourselves to, uh, to work, that we are embracing of new ways of thinking and new realities and new ways of, of incorporating representation into our uh, thinking. And I do think that a focus in on citizen outcomes, direct citizen uh, outcomes, including the use through the use of, of modern digital tools will be incredibly uh, important. I think I got to be frank here. Um, I'm energized. I think this is a great time to be a federal public servant in the national capital region. I think we have incredibly uh, interesting uh, work. I think there's an opportunity to step out of our, our, um, our uh, traditional public service bu bubbles, interact more with, uh, with uh, public servants, uh, with, uh, sorry, with our colleague, with our uh, uh, friends across the, uh, across the country, both in other governments and the actual citizenry. And I think we can make, make it work for, uh, for Canadians. I'm gonna pause, happy to take any questions if there are any, and then I'll turn it over to the organizers to, uh, to uh, set you up in your groups and, and head off into the conversation. Thank you so much for uh, those insights and those um, call to actions for us to really like take charge of what we can as public servants. We are really in a privileged position right now to bring um, to really bring about changes, positive changes to Canadians everywhere. So I'll just ask everyone if you do have some questions, please type them out in the chat. If you go to the bottom of your screen, there should be a little option that says chat. You can open it, you can type your message there, and um, we can kind of sort out however that goes. And I'll, I'll read them out, whatever you type, so that um, Peter can answer them. Um, while waiting for people to kind of, um, to kind of talk, uh, type out their questions, maybe I'll ask you a bit to elaborate a bit on how we can bring that interaction at the, at the citizen level. You talked about different, um, technology and digital tools. So what would that look like on a practical level as we engage to understand more what citizens need? So, so I think that's a great question. And, and I deliberately mushed a bunch of concepts together, at least partly in the interest of, of speed, but also because I think they are, um, they are important. And, and I, I think, so remember that I came to Ottawa directly from working at a municipal level. And at the municipal level, it deals with services that are enormously concrete to, uh, to local uh, residents. Garbage, uh, public health, uh, roads, uh, transit, things that if they, if they break down, you kind of notice it almost immediately. And one of the things it trains you to do, and, and it also trains you to do this a little bit if you're in a provincial uh, work working directly with frontline healthcare or other things, it trains you to think a little bit more directly about the interaction between the programs you're recommending or implementing as a public service and the actual people feeling the benefit of, of uh, that. And I really do think that there's a, a tremendous amount to be said for spending quality time thinking through. And if you can do it by meeting with people and talking to them, that's absolutely the best. But frankly, you can make a lot of progress by just actually thinking through the mechanics of, of as I design this policy, or as I implement this policy, or as I go about my day-to-day -day work, what are the actual impacts of it? How is that felt? How does that have an impact for, um, 
for uh, citizens. And I think that that is frankly, you know, for many of us, it's a thought experiment. I work in most of my time at a fairly high level of abstraction, but I do find I'm by far the most effective when I spend time trying to link what I am working on to the actual public policy good and the direct impact on, on uh, citizens. Really easy if you're actually working through the mechanics of how to modify parks, you know, which is what you do at a municipal. A little bit harder in the somewhat more abstract world of the federal government, but I do think that good public policy implementation and citizen experience come down to much the same thing. So kind of um, on that note, so to deliver those services, we need to have a workforce. So Anna asks, um, so we need to have a representative workforce as a key element. So what are some concrete steps that we can take as a public servant and also at an organizational level? So, so I think it's a great, it's a great uh, question and and we actually as a public service have pretty good uh, representation not perfect not in every category but but um, it, it's not altogether a terrible uh, terrible uh, story and that's nice because we have things to uh, uh, to build uh, on but representation and I think uh, uh, decreases and homogeneity increases as we move up the uh, the management uh, scale so I think that that really the the most important thing is to make sure that we spend time as public servants valuing the input of every single person in the organization and making a workforce in which everybody can contribute and bring their whole selves so that means in particular that as we develop as we manage our workplaces and so many of you will go on you know one of the nice things about IPAC is it does demonstrate that you are interested in public policy you're interested in the outcomes otherwise you wouldn't be part of outcome uh, IPAC that probably means that a great deal of you have already selected to make a difference you're already self-selecting to make a difference in your uh, your careers as you experience the opportunity to make a difference it'll be really important to understand how people give you privilege and make sure that your behaviors do not actually, you know, uh, prevent others from having the privilege that, that you are receiving. Or if you're not receiving privileges, to make sure that you find the way in which you uh, should receive them. And effectively what that means is the informal mechanisms, largely mentoring, that are absolutely hugely important. We need to make sure that we offer for diverse individuals or individuals who come from different backgrounds might actually have not had the same opportunities as everybody else are included in the same career development opportunities. Formal training, but also particularly diverse, uh, diverse, uh, sorry, uh, mentorships and other informal uh, mechanisms. And frankly, it means that people, leaders like me, need to have we need to be you know watched very carefully that we are not just simply reproducing ourselves either our ways of thinking or our literal selves and that we are in fact challenged and that the next generation of of uh, management is substantially more diverse than the current uh, generation uh, i think it's hugely about uh, i frankly think that the single biggest mechanism to do that is is uh, conscious effort and uh, and mentorship across the board I've spent a ton of time of this in uh, Ontario and uh, the city of, of Toronto. I also think it needs to be accompanied by robust unconscious bias uh, training and uh, robust expectations and things like making sure that, that as we put together panels, as we put competitive processes together, as we put together panels on those, they do, they, uh, they do emphasize uh, diversity and inclusion to a maximum extent. And we do hold managers accountable for their hiring practices. Um, the, only, the only thing I'm gonna put in is a caution is that because the public service is, uh, has relatively slow rates of change, it's easy to set expectations that are not meetable. And I think we have to make sure that we set expectations that are meaningful, uh, uh, expectations meaning that we set goals. And we should set goals, but that are realistic and achievable and will be achieved so we don't uh, miss them and generate uh, cynicism. Okay, you know, that's definitely true. We have to remember that the public service is huge and it can take a while to change it. And uh, we do want to change for the better so that we can, as you said, interact with Canadians better. And so 
on that note, Mark Robbins is asking what practical steps can we take to reconcile public servant anonymity with directly engaging with members of the public in a meaningful way? Yeah. That's a totally that's a totally cool uh, uh, totally cool question, and remember that 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 interacting with the public is is you know ideally there's an opportunity for dialogue with people, but but from the public service and especially in a national capital region, especially in a policy shop that many of you will be from, that's a practical matter that's fairly difficult to uh, to do. I actually think the second best thought experiment, which is just to actually really think it through to actually do research, to look at things from a citizen-centric lens, to talk to your friends and family and understand their interactions with the type of programs um, uh, you're talking about, I think that is actually fundamental. And, and um, it, it is not, um, I actually think you have to kind of ask yourself, what are you trying to do with your work? And, and how, what is the impact? And it's actually work your way through the chain. And as I recommend, or as I, you know, check this box, or as I do these things, what are the actual impacts on, on citizens? Don't do it by rote. Actually think it, uh, actually think it uh, through. In terms of the technical issue of uh, public service uh, anonymity, I, I'm going to be frank here. One of the things I loved in, in the municipal world was you were not anonymous. It's not for everybody, but to actually provide your advice and be held accountable for it and, and to stand in front of a council in public and say your, uh, your views is a marvelous and empowering thing. Thing. And I think we do hide behind anonymity to a somewhat uh, greater uh, extent than we, uh, we need to. I think as we're developing programs, it's an enormous gift if you ever have the opportunity to engage with the people affected by those programs and actually have a realistic uh, dialogue. Won't be available to everybody, but if it is available to you, I really encourage you to seize the opportunity and make the best of it. Great. And so we're going to have two last questions before we move on. So I'll just put them together and you can respond to them. So one of them is, um, what might we do to, uh, to keep an innovative culture as working from home can sort of cut people off from discussion and mixing, which often has been a stimulus for innovating. And the other question, uh, a bit more specific, is what digital tools can um, we use in a government job to help people specifically with sight loss, to help them be able to access internet and technology? So. Maybe those are kind of like um, in the same stream as we are all working from home right now and very reliant on technology. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so um, from my perspective, which is is a very odd one, you know, um, sitting there uh, as a deputy. At, at some level, I'm I'm surprised at how well we've done. I'm surprised, and I'll, and I'll be specific to Treasury Board, I'll be surprised how well um, my team can continue to um, work their, their roles as CIO, as, uh, as the uh, Controller General, as the uh, Chief Human Resources uh, Officer, and, and, how, uh, and as the uh, 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 Head of Accessibility for the Public Service, we're able to continue to really drive. And, and, those are all deputy level uh, positions within the Treasury Board uh, Secretariat, along with uh, the Associate uh, uh, Secretary of the Board. And what I'm really, to some extent, enormously pleasantly surprised by is the extent to which we continue to do our core work. And there are real losses in that, uh, but, but with, with the, the need to work uh, virtually, but I think it's been, from my perspective, it's been surprisingly uh, positive. And especially when we began to, to bring on board uh, Microsoft 365 and began to get a little bit better at, at working on Teams and a little bit more collaborative in terms of using the chat functions and, and other things. So, so I'm inclined to view, at least in the short term, the experience as being more positive or less negative than I might have uh, uh, thought. I'm very worried about um, precisely what the questioner has, has asked, which is how do we actually help people you know, make a meaningful difference when they're sitting at home in their boxes, where they're not engaging, when the to and front of dialogue is not available uh, to them. So one practical example is exactly what we're doing right now. I like to actually put together virtual forums that actually do encourage creativity, that actually do encourage that, that, uh, that uh, dialogue. Um, and I think 
frankly, over the foreseeable future, until we actually are out of the pandemic, that's we're going to have to make do with second best. And second best will be virtual. But I think we can overcome a lot of it, frankly, by sheer effort and force of, of uh, will. And I don't think the reform pulse is done. And I, I sit at an organization that oftentimes is a block to reform. I can tell you that Treasury Board Secretariat is incredibly committed to finding ways to actually facilitate innovation, especially in a digital world, but not exclusively in a digital world. So as you are able to organize and self-organize and work things within your work teams and within your departments and, and uh, uh, broader groups, I think you will find that, 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 frankly, the pandemic experience has made for a more flexible uh, government. What I do worry about is young people coming into government for the first time or outsiders joining us who don't have a solid base, who don't have at least a few years of working with us in our, in our kind of lived experience are going to be uh, greatly disadvantaged. And I think that is something that we're gonna need to work on is how do we actually build the public service culture when some of the work is remotely, is remote. And I am hoping that as we get the pandemic under control, and it's a little bit challenging right now, but I am hoping that everybody returns to work in a physical sense for at least some of the time, because I personally believe that that kind of the, the access to ministers and the privilege and the, the opportunity to work closely with senior officials that's been granted to me through a very long time in my career is absolutely essential. It's very hard to pick up uh, 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 remotely. And I think that is going to be something we need to, to work on and work on uh, consistently. And, and as you develop your own management and leadership skills, I think that'll be an incredibly important part about, you know, making sure that you are in the room for at least some of, of the time. Not possible uh, right now. Our highest and best use right now is to keep ourselves and our, our uh, families and our community safe. But I do look forward to a time when we have a mixture of virtual and uh, real uh, in-person uh, interaction. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the accessibility uh, question. And I want to emphasize that, that um, uh, the role of uh, software uh, in, in providing accessibility and digital tools, but the reality is that the pandemic has been particularly challenging for uh, people who are outside of the mainstream in any number of, of uh, different ways. And I think that as we plan our, as we think about kind of the mechanics of offering, of working in a, a virtual world or a world that is a mixture of virtual and, and uh, others, there are some genuine challenges. And I know that the accessibility def, uh, uh, deputy who I work closely with, the excellent uh, Yasmin Laroche has, has uh, expressed in very forceful direct terms. The need to make sure that we don't make mistakes on, on either extreme end of the uh, spectrum for, uh, for people who, are, who uh, require some element of, of accessibility. And, and one of which is that we um, uh, 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 simply fail to uh, bring them into the digital world with the technologies that are available. And the other is that we um, uh, uh, don't want them to uh, return to work because uh, we somehow feel they're more vulnerable. Both of those would be terrible mistakes, and I think they are, you know, uh, absolutely front and center of our planning around managing the pandemic at the at the senior levels of, of Treasury Board uh, Secretariat. I do know that all software decisions, all its all uh, other decisions we make from an HR perspective, need to be thought through an accessibility lens. And I know that Yasmin is working very closely with all others in Treasury Board to make sure that that is available and to be very direct enforced uh, as well. Um, I know I didn't answer the technical aspect of the question, but I think, I think we are spending a lot of time thinking about this and hoping to make it, uh, hoping it to make it work uh, better. Um, anything else? Otherwise, I'll just have a quick closing comment. Have your comments, your closing comments. Great. Um, listen, um, I have a lot of admiration for people who, on a random uh, Tuesday night, taking uh, in the absence of, of an opportunity to get together and have some conversation and at a drink together, the opportunity to try and improve your public policy skills in a virtual world. It's clunky. You know, I'm borderline coherent myself uh, uh, tonight, but I do think that that. Um, 
public policy is an incredibly worthwhile uh, endeavor. I do think that the work we do as federal public servants is enormously important. I think that investing in your skills, investing in your creativity, investing in yourself and making sure that you are part of a more diverse, more technically skilled, it's beautifully, beautifully captured, agile and equipped, um, uh, inclusive public service uh, going forward is something that's deeply, deeply admirable. And I'm, I'm thrilled, frankly, to be able to, uh, to talk to you. And I'm kind of hoping that you're listening to me saying, well, that's a good point and that's kind of crap and that you're uh, uh, putting your own lens on it. And, uh, and realizing that, uh, that uh, what works and what doesn't, and you're gonna bring that reform attitude to, uh, to future conversations. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm sure that'll give everyone lots to think about, think about how to question also everything that you just said. Um, so we'll now move into the next portion, um, the kind of like next